Welcome, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are now halfway through our two-day in-person programming at the British Library, uh, which concludes this evening at 5 p.m. Uh, with Egyptian-American author and activist Mona El Tahawi. Please do scan the QR codes dotted around the building to familiarize yourself with the program, to send us your feedback, and to also pre-order this incredible anthology, Wild Imperfections. Uh, Nikki, Nikki, do you want to wave your hand? Uh, she'll be giving you a bit more information about the pre-orders uh, after this discussion. Uh, we do also have Senegalese food being served outside, so please do grab some food if you haven't already after this discussion. Uh, we hope you enjoy the session, Wild Imperfections, a discussion with contributors of the anthology, Annie Domingo and Khadija Sese, with a video introduction from the editor, Natalia Molebatsi, uh, with readings from Olamide Popola and Kachon, uh, Kachonwa Demwa. Uh, this discussion will be chaired by poet and playwright Tolu Agbelusi, um, and you can also get a copy of her book, Locating Strong Woman, after this conversation, as well as Annie Domingo's book, Outside, after this conversation. So before I hand over to Tolu, I'm sorry, just one last thing that I need to say. Um, a couple more housekeeping points from me. Uh, our, for our live audience, um, please do turn off your mobile phones, or at least have them on silent. Uh, and we aren't expecting any fire alarms this afternoon, so if you do hear one, please do follow the emergency exit signs. Okay. I think I've spoken enough now. Thanks, Tolly. I'll leave it to you now. Thanks. Thanks, Marcel. And good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, especially to those of you who made it in person and also those of you who are following us online. Um, my name is Tolu Agbelusi. I will be your moderator today. And I am joined by Annie Domingo, um, who has an impressive bio, so I'm going to run through it. Uh, <laughs> Annie is a writer director, lecturer, and actress in radio, TV, films, and theater. Her short stories and poems are in various anthologies, including in Wild Imperfections. Her plays have been produced in the UK, and her first screenplay, Blessed Assurance, has just been filmed. An extract from her debut novel, Breaking the Mafia Chain, features in The New Daughters of Africa, which was published in 2019, and the book has now been published uh, by Jack Aranda in September 2021. Please put your hands together for Annie Domingo. <laughs> and to my right is Khadija Sase. Uh, Khadija is a literary activist. She is the former publisher of Sable Lit Mag and is the publications manager for Inscribe at People Tree Press. Her poetry collection is Erky. Did I say that correctly? She is the co-founder of Mboka Festival in the Gambia, the founder of Afri Poetry, and a and PhD scholarship student researching black British publishers and pan-Africanism. This event is presented in partnership with Cassava Republic Press, who is publishing the anthology Wild Imperfections. Uh, and of course, uh, Africa Rights is brought to you by Royal African Society, a Pan-African membership charity, and you can find out more about them uh, and joining them and supporting their work by visiting royalafricansociety.org. The festival um, relies very much on public funding, so if you would like to donate, uh, you can do this by visiting their website. And for those of you who are online, by clicking the link which has been provided to you in the comments. You could also be, uh, consider becoming an arts and culture member so you can get 50% off Africa Rights and Film Africa Festival. There will be time for questions after the conversation. For those of you in the room, there will be microphones roving, which will be sanitized after each question. But if you're still not comfortable using the microphones, you can ask the volunteers to type the questions into a pad for you, and those will be sent up. Um, those of you online, please put your questions in the box below the video. And uh, yeah, I think I've said enough now <laughs> <laughs> on the housekeeping. So without further ado, we will watch the introductory video from Natalia Malibazzi. Hello, my name is Natalia Mulebazi. 
I am the editor of Wild Imperfections, an anthology of womanist poems. It is a great honor and a privilege to curate this gathering of womanist poets from all across Africa and her diaspora. We are here to reach one another, to read one another. This book is about movement building. It is about work that will outlive us. It is a book that is truly womanist, pan-African and intergenerational. It is our hope also that you can join the gathering and be familiar with the work of the many poets who are gathered here from Nikki Giovanni to Diana Ferris to Momtaza Meri to Warsan Shire to Ladan Osman to Malaika Boka and so many more. We invite you to take this work with you so that you can interpret it in your own way and so that the ideas in the book can flourish. Welcome to the land of wild imperfections. We have two wonderful contributors, so the first thing we will do is hear them read uh, one of their pieces each, which are in the anthology. Um, Khadija, would you like to go first? I don't mind, <laughs> uh, since you've nominated me. Okay, um, the first one I will read is actually, I've got four poems in the anthology, and um, I love being in anthologies. I think anthologies are very important. Um, so the first one I'm going to read is actually the last one in here. It's called The Moon Underwater. And it was dedicated to my sister, Safi. And it's um, After the House Was Quiet and the World Was Calm by Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens is an American poet, and I just love the style that he had, the structure of a poem of The House Was Quiet and the, the, house was quiet and the World Was Calm. The moon underwater curves like my sister's smile. As my sister swims underwater, her form is like a smiling moon. She curves, she smiles, she beams. She kisses the moon underwater. Her essence reflects silver like the moon. I read that at her wedding and I couldn't even finish it. I just cried. <laughs> <laughs> that was practice. Now. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Annie. Hi. Um, my poem, the first one I'm going to read, is called The Cutting. Um, I, I did a play two years ago. I, time has sort of concertina, so I don't know, two or three years ago um, at the Park Theatre and it was about FGM, which was written by um, Gloria Williams. And something about it sort of caught my attention. I was playing one of the, there were only three parts, I was playing one of the parts there. And I started thinking about it and I started writing um, this poem. It's called The Cutting. She always knew that her day would come. Girls are born for this. There's no option, no choice no right to complain. No one wants to hear that this act is wrong. Her mother and grandmother survived it. She would too. It is tradition, so they say. The women will cut her, snip at the bud, shave, carve, level it out, infibulate the devil's tongue between her legs to give her a stainless, sinless body she must carry this burden of femininity. It's her duty, her destiny of pain, so they say. Cold breeze blows and sends warning signs. They talk in low voices, ready for the task. Stripped naked, stretched apart, each limb, legs and arms firmly held by them, the holders of torso, obedient and silent. Her screams must be stitched in. So they say, pain eats into her flesh. It comes in waves, each worse than the one before, an ocean of awareness lost in a world of agony. Too late to scream stop, to cry have mercy, lips sewn up, 
leaving only a small opening to answer the call of nature, so they say. Her pace sooth where virginal lips had been, tied with ropes from thighs to toes, no moving, no writhing, she waits to heal. Seal up that place, learn to sit, to stand, do not bend or push those legs apart. Practice the mermaid walk, so they say. Thank you. Thank you. And as you've heard, just from the two poems on the table, the themes in this book are broad. And if there was a way to capture all of the poems that come together here, I would say remembrance. The first poem in the book is a poem by Diane Ferris called I've Come to Take You Home, which speaks back in time to, to Sarah Batman and says basically to her, you know, we remember you. And apparently the notoriety that that poem ga gained was responsible for shaming the French authorities into finally returning her remains to South Africa in 2002. Then you have poems in here from Nikki Giovanni, which speaks about Rosa Parks. So that whole thing about honoring, remembering those who have gone before, but not just that. We're also honoring those who have gone too soon, the Sandra Blands, the, the, the others who we know amongst us. And then there's also a call to remembrance of those who are living, um, us, that we should remember ourselves, that we should see ourselves and remember who we are. So an anthology like this in, in saying see, uh, see the breath of who we are as women, as black women, also calls us to discovery. And in that spirit of discovery, my first uh, question to both of you actually is, who are the, the women poets, the feminist poets, who have shaped your literary journey and why were they important to you? Poetry for me is something that comes from within. I don't know when I sit down to write whether I'm going to write a short story or a novel or a poem. It, this, the subject sort of speaks to me and tells me where I'm going to go. And so one of the f main people, main feminist poets for me is the one and only Maya Angelou. Um, I find that what she writes about is so, um, it, although it's set in the black world, it speaks universally, it speaks to all people. And the subject that she chooses are ones that, um, I see them as sort of standing up and saying, I dare you to tell me otherwise. So when she, uh, one of her favorite, poem, my favorite poems of hers is, I, And Still I Rise. And that spoke to me in so many ways that I then um, translated it into my native language, um, which is Creole from Sierra Leone, because I think that sometimes we need to make it even more of our own. Um, the other um, po uh, poet that I, I love, and I, I've read a lot of her poems, is Nikki Giovanni. Um, which I find is absolutely amazing that I'm in the same anthology as somebody like her, and also Norby C. Phillips, and she's also in the book, because they both, um, it's the subjects that they take, the subjects that they, they, they deal with, and um, the style that they deal with it. Nikki Giovanni, for example, uses a lot of, um, besides metaphors and similes, she does a lot of repetition um, to emphasize what the subject is about. And for me, that's a style that I've, I've developed where I do a lot of repetition of phrases or words. Um, and Norbisi deals with some big subjects, well, um, Maya and Nikki deal with big subjects of racial tensions, uh, prejudice, um, the violence. But Nikki, um, Norbisi's poem, The Zong, has held me, and I go back to it, which is a whole um, full book of poems just dealing with um, the, the, the Zong trial, which was um, this, a time when 130 slaves were thrown off um, this ship because um, th they wanted to claim insurance because they were running out of water and all sorts of things. But the whole poem is written looking at the transcript of the trial. And she writes in a way that brings you into the subject. But it's also the way she puts it on the page. It forces you to, to, to 
break up and to think. It gives you moments to think and then to carry your head. So I'll, I'll stop there. There's at least three. I could name a few more, <laughs> but for different reasons that excite me and make me want to write poetry, but also to read it. I think when you feel that they're speaking to you personally and that um, it's, it's almost conversational and they're bringing you into their thoughts, that's what fires me up and makes me want to write. Mm, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I, it's it's uh, interesting because I really like Maya Angelou's too, but I, I never kind of put it into my head that she was one of my... Fem, my, my poetry men, mentors, in mm. a way. But when I think about it, I've only read her poetry. I've never read her other work, only yeah. her poetry. Because that's, again, is what spoke to me. Yeah. Um, and so I'll just throw it out there. Um, and Still I Rise, in Creole, by Annie Domingo, is online. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I just want to, it's fantastic, so please go and check it out. Um, but the main person for me, I have to say, is Sonia Sanchez. Mm. Oh, my gosh, Sonia Sanchez and I, Sister Sonia, it's... She's wonderful. Um, I love haiku. I write very short poems, and I like to try and pack a lot of layers of meaning into very short lines. And Sonia Sanchez does, does both very well. She is a master of haiku. You know, when, like when you're a poet and they say, well, learn the rules first, then you know how to break them. That's what she's done. So she writes haikus. She writes tanku, tankers, but she's developed her own songkus since she's Sonia. And uh, they're fantastic. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and, she, and she has a bluesy haiku too. You know, she, everything is there. Um, another two poets I like, I just mentioned really quickly. Um, and, you know, there haven't been a lot of African women poets around that much mm. published. It's been really difficult, but with, with recent uh, movements, that, that's kind of changed. So there's a lot of poets I admire now, like Water and Shire, for example. Um, but another one I really like is Rita Dove. Oh, yeah, because yeah. I really like structure and style, and she is great. And there's a fantastic article that the Washington Post did of hers. It's called something like um, in, in her, something to do in, in her dreaming. It's about 20 years ago, and I saw that article, and that is what inspired me to start Sable Lit Mag, because she, she broke down the poem. It's a very short poem, and she talks about um, and, and this is also the essence of good journalism because it was a really really good article and she writes in coloured file in coloured folders. Oh. That's how she writes. And it was a really short poem, but she broke everything down line by line. And when she wrote the line and when she changed it, um, fantastic piece of work. And oh, I'd use it for teaching. <laughs> I'd use it for teaching as well. Did you keep that practice? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just the last one I just mentioned, name Lucille Clifton is also yes. totally, totally amazing. Just very deep and sometimes almost very. Uh, some of her is very eerie sometimes her mm. work, you know. But again, I really like structure and style, and they're all really. They I mean, that. I think that's what moves us along. But it's the yes. different styles that make it's, it's exciting. Yes. yes. And, opens up possibilities. For me, it means that I can, I can uh, uh, go at it at which, whichever way I want to because I have the freedom of those that have gone before me yeah, to yeah. show me different styles. I don't have to do it in one way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we mentioned uh, earlier there are 39 poets in Wild Imperfections from all across the, the diaspora. Chiwangwa Dema, is one of those poets, and we're going to watch a video from her. But before we do, I'm going to say a little bit about Chimama. She, her first collection, if you don't have it, help yourself, get it. <laughs> um, it's called The Careless Simstress. It won the Silliman First Book Prize for African Poetry. Um, she has been very instrumental, or she was very instrumental in setting up the poetry scene in Botswana. Every time I hear her, I am moved by her. Um, so it's no surprise that I find her words in this collection. Um, we will hear the poem, and then we'll talk a little bit more. <laughs> Chiwangwa Dema. Hello, and thank you for joining us as we celebrate this, um, the birth of our wild imperfections, which uh, has, of course, been compiled and edited by the lovely and talented Natalia uh, there's not much to say about the anthology that hasn't already been beautifully put um, 
by Bernadine Evaristo in her exemplary foreword to this anthology and do make sure uh, to read that as well when you grab your copy of the book. So before I read my one poem, which is one of three that I've contributed to the anthology, um, I will say only this, uh, congratulations to my fellow poets uh, and to Natalia. I couldn't be in finer company. My name is Chawang Adema and this is Loss as Ampersand. And in this house, death hovers like time, is time. We learn to count the ways it comes for you, crossing a road, mother-in-law with bitter leaves for a tongue, the wrong word leaving your own mouth, a husband with a temper, and always, always to be a girl with new blood between the thighs. I say to Grace, little sister, your leaving will kill me and keep me all at once. And so you must go. I turn to make language of her memories. Pack cold split pea soup in Tupperware that will surely be missed. Wrap buns baked in a cast iron pot in old clean cloth. I take the beads off my own waist, roll the speckled grey between my palms and set it in hers. She's crying now, but must leave. And I must remember to say the beads broke and fell off. I make her repeat the words that I have had her rehearse quietly all year long. Where to go, the way to go, how to stay silent while saying everything, who not to be when she gets there. All year I skimped on groceries, hid the small change. I open an old packet of sanitary towels, pulled out from what passes for storage, unfurl the currency. My eyes meet her gasp. I neatly tuck all I'm worth into her small bra. Go, I say. This is not the end. Remember me so you may never return to a time such as this. Little sister, if you are reading this prayer, then you are alive, which means some way away from here. So am I. <laughs> um, yeah. Every time I hear I, I hear uh, TJ's work, I, I moved. And the lines that stick out for me on that one is how to say everything. Or say nothing. Whilst, yes, well, how to stay silent while saying everything. And, and then remember me so you may never return to a place such mm -hmm. as this. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're small words, but power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> saying so much. And, and when I think about, about that poem, we're talking about the things that we pass down. Khadija talked about reading Rita Dove and then that being the impetus for, for Sable Lip Mag. That's a big deal <laughs> because Sable Lip Mag, and you'll talk about that in a little bit, um, your work with, with collecting our stories in a bit, but the influences that we have on each other without ever really knowing it. So here in this Britain, for example, we can't talk about black, uh, black women anthologies, for example, without talking about Daughters of Africa and new daughters of Africa. I mean, I remember being 14, 15, and stumbling on this huge white book in Haringey Library. And I don't know why I took it home, but I did. And I renewed it several times because I had never seen something like that before with so many black women. And I saw myself for the first time, and I don't know that I realized that I was looking for myself before then. Um, and, and that is the, the power of, of these kinds of anthologies. Um, and even I heard Natalia speaking a couple of weeks ago, and, and she was also talking about the fact that Margaret Busby and New Daughters of Africa and, and Daughters of Africa also influenced you know, her own journey in terms of how you, you put work together um, and make sure that you collect our stories. Uh, and uh, 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 the genesis, maybe I should say, uh, of this is that there was an anthology called We Are, which Natalia had done some years back. And for the 10th anniversary of that, she was 
um, going to do a new edition with newer poets. And then she started to speak to Bibi Bakare Yusuf of Cassava Republic Press. And Bibi said, well, why don't you open it up to other women, black women around the diaspora, so you make it a real Pan-African project. And so this was born. And even with that, we're still talking about influence. People who don't just plant ideas, but who also say, well, I'll publish it too. I'm fine to do that. I'll put my money where my mouth is. You know, and... and so this is very much about discovery because in as much as I can read this and there are lots of people I know, um, there are also people I, I know absolutely nothing about. So we're going to stay in the spirit of, um, of discovery and archiving and why it is important. And I'm going to go to Khadija on this. Um, you have edited quite a number of anthologies. Mm -hmm. um, Sable Litman has stopped running uh, yeah. it's, it's suspended, should it's we suspended. say? It's suspended. Uh, I, I can't say yeah, I've given it up. I've suspended. Okay. Save lip my is suspended. We're hoping it comes back. Um, and now you're doing something called Afri Poetry? Yes. So I want you to talk a little bit about that because from where I'm sitting, all of that also sounds like what this is doing in a way in terms of collecting our work. It is. So why is that important to you? It's important to me because um, Afri Poetry is... Um, uh, for techie people, it's an SIV, I've been told. <laughs> Selective interactive video. So it's just like a video-based app, right? It really, it's really video that drives it. Um, so when I was publishing my first collection, which was in 2013, and I wanted to think about how to promote it, and because I'm also into publishing, I thought, well, okay, um, you know, old-style publishing, an old-time print, I'd do it like this, and I'd dick around a mini exhibition to libraries. And then I thought, okay, take it to the other end. In the future, how would I do it? And it's going to be digital. So I had a little app of about 20 poets because it's more fun promoting other poets with yourself. So even on that, it was like an anthology. It was like 20 poets. And because I'm really, I'm a, I'm a Pan-Africanist and I've been asked to write a poem about, to commemorate, it was like the 1945 um, uh Manchester Conference, Pan-African Conference. So I thought, oh yeah, so I wanted to put them together, the Pan-Africanism and the poetry. So I had a, an app called The Modern Pan-Africanist Journey okay. um, with 20 poets on it. So that was kind of like at the beginning of my PhD. By the time I finished my PhD, which I was like, oh gosh, I've got to get back to some, <laughs> some real life now. <laughs> Oh, and I thought to myself, let me develop this app. And the people I, I, who'd done it for me, who did, who'd done it for me, said, this is really fantastic. Why did you just leave it? I said, because I was, you know, I was doing other things. So then we came up with this, um, a, another project that was, was more poets and more Pan-Africanism. <laughs> and just merging them, to, kind of bringing them together. So now I'm building and developing this platform so that you can read, you can see, you can hear poets across the continent of African descent on this one platform. And alongside it, you'll have um, and I've called them ancestor poets. So there's about a page of poets who've passed all Pan-Africanists, and most Pan-African leaders wrote at least one poem. They were either poets, published poets anyway. And I then I started looking, thinking they all seem to have written poetry. So that is on there, and just different poetry resources um, from everywhere, and different magazines. So there's stuff for emerging poets, and there's stuff for more established poets. So all the poets on there gave me tips for emerging poets. And I said, well, what book would you read if you had to travel on a journey? And of course, most of them wanted to have more than one. Restricting them to one was difficult, you know, and favorite poetry. So just things like that. So every time I thought I'd finished collecting some material, I decided to put more on there. But, you know, it's just, it started off as fun and it's ended up as this platform project. <laughs> <laughs> but it is about archiving. It is very much about archiving. Yeah. But there's actually a, a bigger archive by uh, what Kwame Dawes is doing in the States, the African Poetry Book Fund. And they have got a big project of archiving African poetry that they're working on now. I thought I should mention that because um, that's pretty important. The chapbook collection or something else? Uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's a digital um, I'm not sure what it's called, but if you go online, African Poetry Book Fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you'll see there's some details about this archive that they're putting together of African poetry from the year dot. Oh. Yeah, yeah, they got some, back a bit. Yeah, yeah, they got some funding to do that. So yeah, so that's one of my yeah. archive things. 
Cool. Um, and I mean, in, in, in this book, Jumake Verisimo, who is a Nigerian poet, has a poem called Lockdown Journaling. And one of the lines in that poem uh, says something along the lines of, we have found a way to be seen by stealing our lives from their mouths, mm. which I was like, again, short lines, but power. When we're talking about collecting our stories, making sure that we tell our own stories for ourselves, um, that is what that is going back to. And Annie, I'm going to come back to you to read in just a little while. I'm <laughs> okay. prepping you. Um, <laughs> You were in New Daughters of Africa. Yes. You're in this. Yes. Uh, what is, why is it important to you to appear in these kinds of collections? I, I remember the first time I saw, I, I read um, one of these anthologies. Mm -hmm. And what was exciting for me was to see the different people that were in it and the different styles and um, sort of just getting me interested in, I've never heard of this person. I must go and find out some more. And with the new Daughters of Africa, um, I'd heard about the Daughters of Africa, but I'd never actually been able to get hold of it because online it's like super expensive and I haven't been to a library. But I'd, I'd read some of its snippets, so I was very interested. And when I heard they were doing the new Daughters, I did not see myself as somebody who would be in that kind of a th um, anthology. Yeah. However, they were doing a, um, a competition for a voice that hadn't been published. And I, will, I reluctantly um, sort of entered, and to my surprise, I won. So then, here was I in this anthology with people that I've admired for years, and it gave me some kind of a confidence that we have all have our own voices, and even if you've not been published, you have something to say. Mm -hmm. So when this, um, and I've been in other anthologies with poetry, and I find that really interesting to see the ideas of people and what they're writing about. And being in this, again, with some of the people I've admired and been reading their things. I've been reading Khadija's um, po poems. Um, as I said, Nikki Giovanni, Jackie Kay, all of these people whose work I've admired. And to see my own work there, boy, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it feels absolutely wonderful. And, but it also gives me the feeling uh, I'm also a, a, a teacher, a lecturer. For me to say to my students, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. You know, just keep on reading and find out that you will find your own style and it will fit in somewhere. And it's easier to fit into an anthology, even if you haven't got a whole body of work for uh, your own uh, publication. That can come. But it's being amongst such class that I enjoy and the fact that when somebody opens a book like Wild Imperfections, they don't know what they're going to find yes. and what they're going to discover, the people, the stories, the ideas. Hmm. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you have quite short poems. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you to read two poems, but there's one of your poems that I particularly want you to read, and if you read that as the second one of whatever you read, okay. um, and that is The Most Beautiful Sound in the World. Okay. So you can read whatever you're going to read and then read that one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to read Tattoo. My body, marked from the age of 15 as a pending expectant. Stretch marks. Small udder marks. Ready for a baby to suck. That closed like an anemone prematurely. Distended belly that never flattened. Since then, my mother has never looked at me naked. Um, and the second poem, that's even shorter. <laughs> <laughs> the title is called The Most Beautiful Sound in the World. Water in the dry season, running from a communal tap. <laughs> Thank you. Three lines, short, <laughs> but. <laughs> I read it, I, I came across that poem when I was going through the book um, this weekend in, in preparation, and I thought, just look at that. At, at the community jumps out. Mm -hmm. First of all, the title, The Most Beautiful Sound in the World, and then this people, it's dry season, water is good. <laughs> you 
you know, but then it's, it's not just that you're getting water in dry season, it's that you're doing it with people, right? That we're doing these things together, that we're in this room together. Um, I'll tell you what took, took me longest on that poem. Did. The question mark at the end of the title. <laughs> I thought, should it be a question or should it be a statement? Statement, yeah. And that's the thing with poetry, right? Yep. You can spend days agonizing over a, a, a punctuation. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. The beauty of editing. Sometimes <laughs> it's beauty, sometimes it's pain, but the poems come out great by the time they reach you. Um, thinking about community. Mm hmm I mean, it's in some press thing that I read, so I'm sure you don't mind me saying that I'm that that you you're around the tenth anniversary of your of your seven year birthday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you you can go right ahead and say I am I am jolly proud of the fact that I'm almost seventy two, <laughs> and I have. And, and I have just published my debut novel it's, this week. And yes. That is, yes. And that is where I'm going. <laughs> so at, at, at a stage where most people are wrapping up careers, you have several and you're starting a new one because your debut collection, yes. Breaking the Mafia Chain, is coming out now. And one, I want to know what that experience has been like, but I also want to know in this um, spirit of community that, that uh, Khadija's poem just talked about, how... Um, has community, but particularly the Fellowship of Black Women, mm. uh, supported you in that journey of entering this new phase? I think that community... Um, I've always written, but I never thought that I could publish because it was more like a hobby. Um, I'm interested in words, but I went into theatre and acting and directing. But all the time I dabbled in writing and... It's amazing when, when you just get a little bit of encouragement and you start thinking, oh, maybe I can do that. And so it's been the friends and people who have sort of encouraged me when I've said, no, no, I'm not good enough. <laughs> They're going, no, that's really good. Um, one of them is sitting over there, Khadija, <laughs> <laughs> who has been uh, uh, one of my mentors. Um, you've been a part of it. We have worked together. Um, and I must say that somebody like Bernadine Evaristo, she has been absolutely amazing with um, all writers, but especially black writers. And Bernadine, of course, wrote the foreword. Right. Right. For and and um, I can remember when the journey of my, of my novel started when I wrote as a short sort of piece when I was doing my master's in creative writing. And then um, I put it by. And then somebody, my tutor said, this is really, really good. You should carry on. And I put it by. And then I, was t um, I found out about the Lucy Cavendish um, competition at, at, at Cambridge. I live near Cambridge. And two other friends, one of them black, one of them white, who had seen it. I said, I've only got sort of like four chapters. And they said, no, you've got to send it in. And then it was shortlisted. And I got an agent from it. And I thought, now I've got to finish the damn book. <laughs> and then life took over. And I was doing a lot of things. And I would get into it. But New Daughters of Africa forced me to finish it. Mm. And from that, winning that and going into that pushed me into finding um, a publisher and get going on that journey. So it's been sort of like um, being pushed by people supporting me, by people like Margaret Busby saying, you know, this is good. When they choose it as, uh, to win out of thousands of other entries, it gives you such confidence. And... Age is but a number. I do 10 million different things. Yeah. And so it's only after it's been published that people keep talking about in your 70s. I go, so what? I, I intend to be here in my hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> I've told my children, if I die, don't cremate me, bury me, because when they find out what's wrong, they can put me together again and I can finish the things I have to do. <laughs> so, um, but it's been with encouragement. It's been with people who have sort of said, yes, this is, this is good enough to make you go on. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, I've now got a, an agent, I've got a publisher, and I'm writing the sequel to that novel. So in about two years' time, I'll be back. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and in between, I, I write the poems and whatever that comes to mind. Very briefly, yes. um, tell us what it's about. Um, I'm from Sierra Leone, and for years, when, you, when you're a child, you hear these stories and you don't take any attention, pay any attention to it. 
But it was a story about this girl who used to be a slave and then was adopted or brought to England as um, a gift for Queen Victoria. And they changed her name to Sarah Forbes Bonetta. And I knew some of her descendants. I did not know much about her. And in fact, it was because of my masters that I started looking for a story that pertained to me, that told my story about um, being from Africa and some of the things that happened. I did not want to write about the slave trade, but it has, it is part of our history. So this story is about Sarah Forbes Burnett, but it starts when imaginary, because I wasn't there, <laughs> what her life was like before she was captured. Mm -hmm. And then she was brought to England at the age of about seven or eight, uh, having been from her village to being a slave in King Gezo's um, Dahomey, to coming and being treated as the black princess and being fated all over the place and written about. And I just put myself, what was that eight-year-old girl feeling and thinking as she saw, had all these new experiences? So it's about Sarah Forbes Bonetta. And they sent her back after one year, back to Africa. And I thought, what, was her, what, what did she feel like being on that ship going back to where she had come from? And what were her wants? So that's what this book is about. And this sequel comes when she comes back because she does come back to, Eng to England. Tolu, I just wanted to add something to the community. Yep. The last time that Annie and I were both on this stage, we were on this stage together, and we were in this corner, and there was an anthology, again an anthology. Yeah. For, and this was um, across continents because the, it was produced in the States. So Gwendolyn and Brooks. Mm -hmm. And yeah. again, talking about Golden different shovel. stuff. Yes, Golden Shovel. Yeah. I was in the room. You were in the room, <laughs> Golden yes. Shovel. There you go. And um, I'm also from Sierra Leone, but I'm not a native Creole speaker. And my Creole speaking is terrible. And I wanted people to understand <laughs> what it was like. So I invited and asked Anya, Annie, please, you know, can you read the Creole parts of my poem? So I read the English lines and she read the Creole lines. And people kind of like, what's going on here? Because again, it was a short poem and it was over. <laughs> God. But again, it was like the style of Gwendolyn Brooks. We had to recreate yeah. um, this poem. So, and, I, and I really wanted to write it in, in, in Creole and English. Yeah. The, the, the joke about this is that I was born in England. <laughs> and when I went back to Sierra Leone, I didn't speak Creole. And they used to laugh at me. So I've had to work really hard at speaking Creole. And, <laughs> and um, I now try to write also in some things in Creole. Mm -hmm because we were not taught, we were not allowed to speak our language at school. Yeah. So I speak, I write Creole very badly. I read it extremely badly. I'm learning how to do that because I think that that was a disadvantage of being part of the colonial system where we were punished if we spoke any of the indigenous languages. We were not allowed to read it or write it and we were not even allowed to speak it in school. So I'm reclaiming my language. And so when she asked me to read in, in Korea, <laughs> I thought, yes, I made it. <laughs> Somebody believes my accent. But that colonialism <laughs> follows because yes. even though I wasn't brought up in Sierra Leone, my parents were totally adamant. You are not speaking it. Well, my dad. Yeah. My dad is Creole. My mum's Timini Mende. So that was like three languages in the house. My dad said, I can't speak Mende or Timini. I'm a Creole. But, you know, this is not going to help you in school. You have to speak English and you have to speak proper English. Yes. And none of these dropping your T's at the end of words, like you hear people say on the TV, none of that. Yeah. So that colonialism yeah. follows because that is what they were taught. And they told us as their children, there's no way that you're doing that, you know. So, so when yeah. you put Creole in your poems now, mm -hmm. is that some kind of a rebellion almost against that? Yes, that's my decolonization. <laughs> And I make sure I the agree. Creole, and that the Creole has to come before the English version. Yeah. Yes. So I have a poem in my, in Erki, in my collection, and it's my grandmother speaking to each other. None of them, neither one of them spoke English. One spoke Creole, one only spoke Mende and Timini. So they couldn't even really speak to each other, but I had to make them speak to each other in the book, and they both spoke Creole, and then I translated it into English. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were talking about my Angela and Still I Rise. Mm. There's something that spoke to me so deeply and so I translated it into Creole because I felt that it, it pertained mm -hmm. all the things that were happening in Sierra Leone at that time. And the biggest, the most amazing thing that for me is that I was able to perform and still I rise in Creole to Maya Angelou and she loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, that's my, you know, 
<laughs> that was something that was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, we're going to come back to Wild Imperfections now. Annie's going to read another poem in a second. But while she's looking for her poem, it's a very good time for me to say that uh, Cassava Republic Press is running an initiative with the pre-orders uh, where I believe it's the first 500 people to purchase um, have their names inscribed in the first print uh, print run of the book. So if you want your name immortalized in the first mm -hmm. edition, <laughs> scan the barcode, <laughs> <laughs> buy the book. Um, another reason to buy. And the UK version is uh, being published on the 30th of November, the worldwide version for the rest of the world is coming out in February 2022. You ready, Eddie? Yep. Okay. Um, I was going to read um, a different poem. I've got three poems in the book, but after something that um, Khadija was reading about children, I decided to read this one that's called Empty Cradle. Um, I, my, my mother had given up on me. I did not get married till I was very, well, I was in my late 30s, and she thought nothing was going to happen there. And then um, I couldn't have children, and we tried and tried. And I would see people with their children and the longing and the um, feeling, why not me, engineered this poem. It's called Empty Cradle. Uh, the, the thing was also, you, wherever you went, in the, within the African community, they would go, why haven't you got a child yet? When are you on the side inspecting your stomach? And sometimes they are even so rude as to touch your stomach to see if you were really pregnant but not saying anything. And you can't keep going on to everybody about it. So this is called Empty Cradle. Joyful announcement, their angel child. Oh, what a picture, what a photograph. Rockabye baby, no bundle of joy. Silently cradling my bundle of pain. Searing ache for lost precious child. Nothing. Lightweight, heavy, in love, hate her arms. They cannot conceive. They do not know the br brutal cruelty of perpetually failing. Internal clock ticking, a tick tock, tick tock, longing for that missing child. Nothing. Children, children everywhere. Pregnant women, smoking, drinking, beach ball bulge, proudly thrusting. When the wind blows, Cricking, kicking, punching, coveting that special child, nothing. Desperately counting calendar days, coaxing tired love hate machine, erect, crying, hurry, hurry, do it now, a million baby kisses I'll deliver, praying, aching for a heart child, nothing. Waterlogged ovaries, fallopian tire tubes, legs strung up like hunks of meat, Cells dividing on clear plastic dish, cradle falling as the bow breaks, conceiving clinically a spirit child, then nothing. Heart rapidly beating a tattoo of hope, spark of fragile humanity lighting, one day pregnant, then bleeding hell, no cradle to rock, departing your fantasy child, nothing. Hear me, angels, Mother Mary all. Frenzied rhythm of despair, pounding on hassock pew and chancel floor, by the light of the silvery moon, cursing dreams of miracle child, nothing. Heart burning, ashes smoldering, flickering flames of desire dying, cruel reality, an empty womb. Aged clock will never strike one. Dream child, heart child, desired child. Nothing. Thank you. Heavy. And, and it is important, of course, to talk about these stories because that also links with one of the, the, the tattoo right. poems yes. yeah. that you did. And there are other poems in the book that talk about loss, um, that talk about miscarriages. Um, and when you read these things, for those who have been through it, you're seen. There's some release in the fact that you're not alone in this thing. Mm -hmm. For those who haven't been through it, you see. And you're able to understand other people better. And that just brings home the importance of poetry 
the importance of this tiny snapshots that we have on single pages or several pages that hold you, you know, for it, for, for a moment and keeps coming back to you in the way that it reflects uh, the realities of those around us and our realities too. Um, we're going to hear a poem, uh, a recorded poem now from Olimide Pokwola, who is a Nigerian-German writer, essayist. Uh, she's written short stories, a novella, a novel, a play, and um, she holds a PhD in creative writing and curated Berlin's inaugural International African Book Fest. Olumide Popola. Hi, my name is Olumide Popola, and I'm super excited to be part of Wild Imperfections. It is such a wonderful collection of womenist writings and womenist writers who are fierce, who challenge, and most importantly, also who bring the joy and the fierceness. I'm going to read a poem called Show Me. Let's not be strangers to each other, locked away by distance, not the physical, but the not showing, the leaving ourselves half behind, not caring as in a verb, as in allowing to grow and be and feel each other and ourselves. Let's not be strong forever and fierce, kicking asses like we do. Let's fall apart on the kitchen floor or the lounge, not in the bedroom, hidden away with the blinds shut, but in full view of each other, wailing and shouting and raising ourselves. Let's not be self-sufficient and capable. Those that make things happen, taking care of nothing today. Let's be shameful and silent, not resisting or caring our children, not plotting and making it through. Be broken in all pieces without putting back the jigsaw. Let's listen carefully, not to the words which we are so good at uttering, precise and relevant. Let's be quiet and hear the pain, the heartache, the tired of it all. Show me, and from there, the ground we lie on, we can see the world above. Let us not be strong forever. I mean, good admonition. Let us fall apart in full view of each other. That whole idea that we own ourselves, all of ourselves, without the performance, um, is something that pervades a lot of my work. Uh, and when I look at the title of this book, Wild Imperfection, you know, that whole thing, I think there was a line in there that said, let us be shameful and silent. Um, and, and for me, that immediately brought to mind, yes, wild. And all the pejorative connotations of the word, particularly when they're used with, um, with Africans and black women. And so this is a question for both of you. Uh, what does it mean to you, that title, wild imperfections? It's funny because I, I like the way it's actually written, <laughs> you know, with the imperfections, with the I am crossed out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we, we can't always all, all the time be perfect. And why should we? You know, and, it, and, and in some ways, um, it really also spoke to how black women are perceived, as you, as you touched on. Because we're always told that... You know, I've had some very weird things said to me sometimes, like, you know, just in terms of maybe if you've, if you've ever been somewhere and, um, you know, and just say um, at one stage I was trying to lift a small table into the back of, of, of a car and I saw, I'll call him a young man, standing there asking him to help me. And I saw him help this blonde lady help, her, help something into a car for her. So I said, oh, do you think you can come and help me? He goes but you're a strong black woman like my mother. And I kind of thought, <laughs> you can imagine what I wanted to say. <laughs> I really needed some help. And I'm thinking, I'm about 20 years older than her. Just come help me, will you? Do you know? And it's kind of like, why are we always expected to be strong black women? Yes, we are, but not all the time. You know, we, we cry. We are yeah. vulnerable like, like everybody else. And this book allowed us to do that mm. in a sense. It was like, I felt like I was in a, a safe space to be able to do that to be able to be vulnerable and be able to, you know, 
say say things maybe that I didn't say. That's why I'm really glad that Natalia picked the um, the really short poem about the communal about um, the water yeah. and collecting communally, commun communally. So it's it's a really important title to have because I think it just it basically says it, it it's given that those different senses of of what women are of what of who we are should I say yeah. we we are perfect and we are imperfect and that's quite Absolutely. all right. Mm. Yep, it yeah. is. I mean, <laughs> for me, I love the title as soon as I saw it because. When you talk about a black woman, it's the angry black woman. As soon as you, you sort of say anything that is um, your opinion, but you say it strongly, you don't even have to shout, but immediately they assume that you are being angry and wild and flamboyant. And it says all of these things mm -hmm. that is sort of sometimes seen as wrong. So it's imperfection. Mm -hmm. But by crossing it out, the I am, it says all of those things a part of our perfection, part of who we are, mm -hmm. and that we can cross out the things we don't want. We're not waiting for you to tell us who we are. Mm. So for me, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, title. Very clever. It says so much if you want to read into it. But if you can't read into it, it's your loss. <laughs> <laughs> And, and clearly, there's a strong element of, of reclamation of the word wild. Yes. As well. And with that, I, I'm interested in how, if at all, um, you both in your work consider reclaiming language that have been used against us. Mm. So any of you... <laughs> I think in some ways we touched upon yes. that when we were talking about the Creole and yes. the English and stuff like that, because that is definitely reclaiming language. So for me, the reclaiming language definitely is the reclaiming the African language um, a, a lot, um, rather than thinking of reclaiming different particular kind of kind of words to describe something. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to encourage other people to use and reclaim that, that, that language as well. Because yeah. I, I sometimes feel it's really, um, I've judged a couple of competitions before. I think I, I was one of the first judges on the Brunel Poetry Prize and I was a little bit disappointed that none of the African writers wrote anything in, or, or, or used any African words in any of their poetry. And I thought to myself, even if the poem hadn't been that good. If somebody had done that, I would have picked them. Honestly, I really <laughs> would have done. You know, your judges, and this is why you've got to know who your judges are, yeah. because it would have shown that they are, are number one kind of reclaiming, but try identifying themselves them, themselves in different ways, mm -hmm. you know. And, and sometimes when I, when I am in Gambia, I've heard some of the young people there speak here, they, they'll, they'll rap and they'll rap in about six languages. It's great. Yeah. It's lovely, you know, and it's just bringing that whole different flavour and really kind of showing just how strong you are being able to bring in all of these different tones of yourself. Mm. But I think, I think it, it spreads wider than just your language. Once you yeah. claim your language, then you start claiming who you are in yes. all aspects. I mean, at one time, I look at us, we're wearing things that show our Africanness in, ver in a variety of ways. Mm. There was a time when you would not have seen a single African ma looking material on the stage because you would have been expected to dress and speak in a certain way. So once you start reclaiming your language and who you and saying who you are through words, you start seeing who you are in all sorts of ways. Mm. Um, yes, it can be bright. Yes, we can, you know, when I, when I was um, in England in the 60s, you w if you wore an African costume or even African material, the looks that you would have, mm. and they go, you're so wild, you're wild, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. And, and you would sort of only keep it to certain times when you were at a party of your own kind. Whereas now we can go out and wear what we want to wear. We can have our hair in twists or braids or whatever. Um, and it comes from us having the words to explain, uh, to, to say who we are. So it, it, it marries, it, it's all part of this um, opening up of people in the diaspora especially, because this was happening in, if you were in Africa or somewhere. But in, in, if you were in America or you were in England or Germany, you, would, you tried to conform in all sorts of ways, um, both in your speech, in the words you use and the way you dressed. Mm. 
And just as a follow-up to this reclaim in conversation, but also to the poem um, that Lundu uh, Kupola read, that whole thing about being able to fall apart. A lot of times we talk about strength and then we talk about vulnerability as though vulnerability is the opposite of strength. Mm. When in, for me anyway, a lot of times vulnerability itself is strength. Yes. Because it mm -hmm. takes a lot for you to be able to, be to allow yourself to be mm -hmm. vulnerable. And um, I, I often ask women, who and what is a strong woman for you? Because we have the trope. Most of us don't believe in the trope. Most of us hopefully have moved to the point where we don't want to have to endure things. We don't want to endure just so somebody can call us strong black women. But we still, there's still something about strength. You know, strength of character, strength of whatever. There, there are still strengths that we aspire to. So I'm always interested, and this is a, uh, I'm stretching it out so you can think about it. <laughs> but I'm always interested in, in, in the journeys that people have made in terms of women, especially have made in terms of conceptualizing strength. What you thought it was, and now, with the passage of time and experience, what you now think it is, and how that new conception, you know, helps you to be a better woman. It's interesting that you say that because um, I've been thinking about that recently in respect to like my mom and like um, I'll just drop in, hint, hint. I'm doing this event tomorrow <laughs> um, around Nawal El Sadawi, which is going to be on the uh, at the British Library on online. Um, if people want to join us, it would be great. Um, and I, I absolutely love Noelle Sadari from the first time I met her. I went to an event, and it was in Paris, because I wanted to have her on the, co on the cover of my magazine, Sable. It was all activist writers on, my, on the magazine. And when I saw this Egyptian woman up there, and I was just hearing her say to this room full of women, because I think it was an um, International Women's Day event, I'm Egyptian, but I'm also African. Egypt is in Africa. What is this Middle East? I thought, I love this woman. <laughs> you know, and I thought, you know, these are the kind of things we expect, you know, we want particular icons to encourage people to say. And I've always really admired Nawal al Sadari in terms of saying what she wanted to say in terms of just really, you know, in, in her work and personally. Um, I think she was, she was just amazing. And then I used, always used to give the copies of Sable to my mom, you know, just, just as a matter of fact, I just give them a, a bit of everything. So like, you know, I'll go and give them world imperfections. I don't know if they're going to read it. They might just look at the cover. I have no <laughs> idea. But then all of a sudden, my mother started quite quoting Nawal El Sadawi to me. I'm like, when did this happen? <laughs> you know? And then my mother would drop little hints like she was fighting back. And, said, and you know something, you know what your father said to me? And you know what I said back? And I'm like, my mother, my West African mother, coming from this space where you just do what your husband told you to do, and my mum's fighting back, I'm like, wow. So I saw a new strength in my mother that I never saw before, you know, but it was a quiet strength as well. And then I had to rethink that when we were children, you know, my dad is quite a silent type, but very, you know, strong, you know, and, and quite silent. But my mum was there being the protective one, which we never saw, really. And I'm, then I, now I'm older, I start to think about the strength of my mom mm. and how she had to protect her children, how she had to be the wife that my dad wanted her to be, that, you know, perfect African wife, as, as they want their wives to be, but also be herself. How, where did she get to be herself in all of that? You know, so, yeah, that whole spectrum... I like, like you, I like to think of things more on the spectrum. Spectrum, you know, how it, it, it's, it's a, a big one to think about. We don't always think about it at that time. Sometimes we'll think about it years later. You, you, you're talking <laughs> about your mother. Um, I see a lot of us, we have a strength in age. Mm. I find myself much stronger now I'm a, an old woman. <laughs> 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 Whatever old woman is, <laughs> but it give, I feel that I I'm free to be who I am, and if you don't like it, move out of the way. And that's a kind of strength that we're not given mm. when we're younger, mm. you know. And I see, and I, then I start thinking about my mother and the strength that she had that we did not always recognize. 
I mean, it's the strength of going into a room on your own, mm -hmm. you know, because we were always thought you'd go with somebody else. It's the strength to say, this is what I want to do, whether I'm 70 or 90. Mm -hmm. It's the strength to say, yes, I can sleep all day if I want, but I can sleep for one hour if I want. It's my choice. Nobody can tell me who I am or how I should behave. And so there's, there are lots of strengths, quiet strength, um, a, um, a loud strength, mm -hmm. um, a, a strength that says, this is my space. Mm -hmm. Don't cross it. And that goes for the society. It goes for your children. It goes for your husband. Make your space and claim it. And that's a, quiet, that's a strength that we are developing. But I think that a lot of it comes with, with, with age as well. Mm. And I am claiming my strength. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a poem um, in, can I borrow your book? There's yeah. a poem uh, on, in this collection by, by somebody who I, I came across for the first time um, reading this. But in terms of language and reclaiming language, um, I felt like we, we, her name is Julie Jokoto, and this is a poem called Weapons of War. Um, and it goes, cheap is a word for goods on sale to lowest bidders. Sister, is your daughter for sale? Cheap is a tool in an armory crafted to control, brand, and weaponize the only thing its owners see in a woman. Their knives, loose, fast, easy, their guns, Cheap, tramp, slag, their bums, hoe, slut, cunt, sister. Don't take off those arms. Don't ever let these words cast down your baby's eyes and fall from her lips. Mom says I'm cheap. Don't use their crude cudgels to butter yourself and your sisters and maim the tender minds of our precious daughters. Don't be defined by their tragic limitations reduced to a twisted, worthless misfit of a fraction in their maneuvering little minds. Sister, break from your bondage. Run from a victory that is your defeat. Lay down those vile word weapons of war and come. Celebrate, cherish, nurture and defend the totality of the wonder that is woman. Julie Jakarta. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it wonderful discovering other women poets like this? Yeah. It's, you know, I did that with, um, with, da with um, New Daughters of Africa as well. And I, and I was going through things and I discovered as well, looking for other poets to, for Afri poetry, uh, Juliana Bitek. And I just kept seeing the name, and I thought, Juliana Bitek. Oh my gosh, she must be related to uh, Okot Bitek. Of course she must be. And then I'm emailing her, she goes, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, the, I'm this daughter. And she's also a poet, published a few collections. And I'm going, I really want to get hold of the original version of your father's book. Is this possible? Because it wasn't originally written in English. Because mm -hmm. you had it side by side in the two different languages, didn't you? Yes, that's what yeah. Yeah, trying to get. So, And so, again, it's just discovering... You, you, it's very hard, it's harder, I think, to discover those kind of things if you're not in the world of an anthology. It, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Then, you, you, then you kind of discover those things, which is really fun. And yeah. yeah. I mean, in terms of discovery, Annie, we mm. have a request um, from someone named Jen online who has said, you know, you've mentioned oh, Still God. I Rise in the old several times. Are you going to read it for us? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have it here. <laughs> hmm. mm. <laughs> um, you do have another poem in the book? Yeah. Um, would you read that for us? Oh, okay. This one is called Because I Am a Girl. And this came about when it was the International Day of the Child. And um, it reminded me of my own rebellious youth because I was such a tomboy and I was forever being told how I should behave as a girl. And this is what a girl should do. And I sure was not doing it. So, <laughs> because I am a girl. Because I am a girl, I work and play with my friends 
I look at the moon and dream of being a teacher, doctor, or scientist, maybe a judge. But I fear these dreams will never come true because I am a girl. Because I am a girl, I am last in my family, but always first, up to cook and clean. Boys bully me, men desire me, teachers ignore me. Forced out of school, there's no more reading, writing, solving equations, because I am a girl. Because I am a girl, I know my education, vital passport to the future, will fade away. A body still juvenile forced into marriage to bear babies while the watery moon wanes and mourns a lost childhood because I am a girl. Because I am a girl, I will fight to follow my dreams, gain strength and wear fearless shoes on the path of discovery, learn to embrace each day, find wings to soar and fly, enabling me to be all that I can be. Because I am a girl. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? And that is questions about, uh, thank you, uh, questions about this, questions about being involved in anthologies and publishing in uh, poetry or writing communities, which both these ladies are part of and which they organize. It's your time to ask. Uh, yes. Something's coming down. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the conversation. I've really enjoyed it. My name's Ifia. And um, I was having a conversation with someone earlier about identity. And my question is through either this specific work that you published or just your work throughout the years, what has it taught you in terms of your personal journeys of identity? <laughs> Who's starting? Can you hold it, you start. And um, as, I said, as I said earlier on, I was born in England and then taken to Africa. And I found that I had to find my identity, really, because when I got there, I didn't speak any of the language. Everything was, was um, strange. And I had to find my own way into becoming a Sierra Leonean. Um, and that goes even to the language which I didn't speak. My identity is that I am black, I am Sierra Leonean, I'm African, I'm English, I'm all sorts of things, but that makes me unique. I am not one thing. I refuse to be put into a box. So when they say, um, when you have to fill in these forms and they go black African or black British, I'm thinking, for me, I'm black British with African roots. Somebody asked me about where, where are you from? And I said, would you ask a black American where they're from? Because they'll tell you, you people stole us and brought us here. You know, <laughs> they, they don't do it. So why do you always have to ask us, where are you from? And not accept that we are part of this. This is part of my identity. I am black, African, British. That's my identity. <laughs> It's funny when you're talking about <laughs> you're talking about the tick boxes. I usually tick other, yeah. and then I write down whatever I feel at that time. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, but usually, I identify as um, you know Sierra Leonean with um, or you know Sierra Leonean with uh, <laughs> born in Britain. You see, even now I'm yeah. stumbling because yeah. I change it all the yeah. time. Yeah. Um, my cousin just asked me to do a little talk for their group next week. Um, on Black History, I said, fine. And I, this flyer arrived, and there's three of us. And for some reason, they put um, British poet and writer. I said, but I never gave that information to you. So do you want to actually take that off and then send me back the flyer? Because how could they decide on, on that to me when I didn't give them that information, you know? Um, so for me, um, yeah, it, it continually kind of changes. changes. Yeah. But when I was raised, when I was brought up, myself, my brother and my sister, we were brought up by private foster parents. I put the word private just because it was very different from um, 
uh, the social services being public. And that happened to a lot of West African children in the 60s. Um, and it's more like sort of like, you know, um, you know, this is the same way they do it, the, the way they do at home and you give your children to somebody to look after. They thought that they're, they're coming to England and they didn't really know what was going on in England and they were working and they thought the best thing to bring us up, to make us even better would be to bring us up by with uh, English parents. And they used to choose working class English parents. And so but it used to horrify my parents when they heard us talk because we talk very, <laughs> cock well, I can't say Cockney was brought up in Kent, but it's like, well, how did our children get to talk like this? We thought that they were going to speak like the Queen, you know? And, and then they didn't because that, they didn't know that. So yeah. our identity was very <laughs> mixed up, you know? And you can actually tell that like in my book yeah. and like, um, and sometimes I'm having food to eat and, and loved English food because we were brought up yeah. with a, 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 you know, a working class English family. And my mum, my foster mum was a fantastic cook, you know? All these, all these great Sunday dinners and, and apple crumble, <laughs> apple dumpling. And I've got this poem that I stuffed the apple dumpling in my mouth and I couldn't get the spoon out because I just loved it so much and that's how I'd eat. But I also loved jollof rice. By the time we were like seven, eight and I was in, um, in London and like my brother was only like nine and my mum accidentally put 15 Trinidad peppers into a big pot of soup, right? So she was going to make another pot to dilute it. My brother ate it. I'm like... <laughs> What is so that's the African in him, right? You yeah. gotta get rid of it. <laughs> so when you talk about identity, there's so many things to identity. But yeah, I, I usually make it up as I go along. My my parents were very strong on us knowing our African identity. Yeah. Because although we were born here, the story in my family is that my sister who was older, we were in the bus and we were the only black people in the bus. It was in the 50s. There weren't very many of us around at that time. The wind rush had just come, mm. uh, you know, two or three years before. And um, my sister apparently said very loudly, oh, mommy, look, look, a black man. <laughs> <laughs> because she hadn't seen very many of them. And my mother, this conversation went on, and my mother was sort of trying to quiet, him, uh, quiet her down. And um, my sister would go on, and my mom said to her, well, daddy's black, is it? No, he's not. <laughs> And, and you black? No, I'm not. I'm English. My mother went home and said, "These children are going back to Africa." <laughs> and within six months, we were back in Africa because they wanted us to understand that although we were British in a way, we were also African, and we were also. It doesn't matter what, how British you think you are. If you're walking down the road, they will see you where they might not see somebody who was Polish or Italian and that, and it separate them. So my parents took us, and although I've got cousins and that who came back to England to go to school, my parents says, we're doing our schooling in Africa, we're gonna know who we were, and um, then we can go out and mm -hmm. we have the basis. So that's why my, my, my basis are always is, no matter where I am, is that I am black, I'm African, I'm Sierra Leonean, and then yes. British. Yeah. And when I, I hear both of you speak, I, I, I think about that uh, quote by Toni Morrison where, where she says um, something about, I, I stood at the border, stood at the edge, I claimed it at central, and let the rest of the world move, it, move over to where I was. Mm. Um, and that whole thing of, well, I make it up as I go along, I don't <laughs> yeah. have to answer the question. Exactly. Um, or because I've stopped questioning myself, I'm all of those mm. things. Yes. Yeah. I'm very much a pan-Africanist yeah. now for me. And so, you know, so I'm glad we have an ECOWAS passport because that's like I move around in, in West Africa quite a lot between Gambia and Sierra Leone. So people often think I'm Gambian, but I am a Sierra Leonean. But, you know, we're part of... Yeah. As, and even when you're in Gambia, they say, oh, you're all part of the same. We're all one family, you know, and, and they will identify. So I'm, my surname is... My mother's um, maiden name is Sase. Mm -hmm. And so... And I took that on board because it was an African. I wanted to be... Fully, exactly. Um, so they try, they identify that with what that, um, in, in Gambia, of which family that goes with it. Oh, you're Sese. Oh, so you're, the, you're part of the Toure's then. You know, so they can identify you like that. So, so I, I have a place in, in the Gambia. Okay, you know? okay, just because mine is Domingo. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> do we have any other questions? <laughs> Uh, whilst you're thinking about it, um, would you like to read your okay. other poem, please? Uh, this last one yes. is a bit like myself, it keeps changing. <laughs> the poem. This one is called Stilled Tragedy. 
photographer arrives in Congo within minutes of her loss. Dead baby granddaughter in her arms. Hot tears, warm body, cocooned by family of women. Their tragedy and grief encapsulated for a contest. A moneyed prize of thousands. Who wins? Photographer arrives in Haiti within hours of her distress. Sends zoomed in snaps of ripped flesh, separated limbs, rubbled homes, tented grief. Children with no hands to wipe away their tears. Sent by satellite to the newspaper, waiting on standby. The first to transfer this agony to the world. No contest. The prize? First on the scene, front page news, pat on the back, money via backs. Who wins? Thank you. And uh, it's only right <laughs> that we read an Italian Mulebazzi poem since she did the That's work true. of editing <laughs> this collection. Um, this is a poem called Lessons to Learn from the Anthology. And it goes like this. I do not know how to receive love, meaning I do not know how to live. I do not know how to dance to love, meaning I do not know how to be human. I want to learn these lessons. Walk like I own the entire city and the body I live in. Choose the battles of my heart. I want to learn the game of counting my blessings and remember that life comes with no manuals and no wings, but with the desire to craft them and have a little fun, maybe. Uh, I want to thank you all for being part of our audience. Uh, on site here in the Knowledge Center at the British Library. Um, I also want to thank those of you who are watching online. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. And thank you to our panelists, Khadija Sase. Thank you. And Annie Domingo. Thank you. Both Khadija and Annie <laughs> <laughs> um, will be signing book plates um, after this session so that those can be put in your books if you're ordering uh, books by pre-order. Um, so please uh, wait around, speak to them, get them to sign. Annie also has books here, so please. And, and you too? Uh, no, 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 I didn't know your books were here. Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the surprise is that it's just about to be launched. It hasn't been launched yet. <laughs> so you're getting the first, you're getting the first it's, bite. It's launched on Friday. So Annie has books here too. So please, uh, they're on sale outside Dubai. See her for signature. I also have books. Um, <laughs> see me to buy. Uh, but thank you again so much. Um, for being here to Cassava Republic Press for this beauty. We can't wait mm -hmm. to actually hold it. Um, and feedback. Very important, but often neglected thing. Um, for those of you who are online, there is a link. Um, please let us know how you found the event. Um, those of you who are here, there are QR codes outside. Please scan them and let us know. Um, what your feedback is because it is invaluable to us. If you would like to support by donating, please consider joining the Royal African Society, which will ensure the continuation of Africa rights. And on that note, good people, thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.